So let's talk about China. But before we talk about China, let's talk about these uh, very wonderful men, wonderful, wonderfully attractive men here. Uh, so I'll go around the, the room. Wei, we'll start with you. Tell us about yourself. Tell the, the, the people at home and the people in this room what you do uh, every day and uh, your title of the business. Sure. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Gabriel. Thanks, uh, Beyond Blocks, for having us here. Uh, my name is Wei Wei Zhou. I'm the Chief Financial Officer for Binance. Uh, I've joined recently, the last for about been there for about three months. Uh, before Binance, I've been CFO at uh, about four separate different companies. The most notable ones uh, is Grinder. So uh, that was a fun experience. But I think hopefully that uh, Binance will be an even more exciting one. And then my role here, uh, in addition, sort of uh, looking over the financial side of the business, is uh, helping us to. Uh, build up the fiat businesses uh, in different parts of the world. So, uh, hello everyone. Thanks, James. I'm Jasper from eToro. I'm the managing director for eToro Asia. So, before joining eToro, I've been also operating business in uh, China for 10 years. So, I'm sure this is a very relevant uh, experience with the topic here. Um, eToro right now is a social trading network that allows people to trade multiple assets, including crypto. We have uh, over 10 mil registered users right now. So um, pretty much, yep. All right, and Ding? Um, thanks, James. Hi, everyone. I'm, uh, my name is Ding, and uh, I came from a background of uh, private equity and venture investment in tech space, in, mostly in China in the last 10 years. I've been involved in a lot of the, 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 the unicorns uh, in the mobile internet space uh, in China. I was also involved in Grindr with Wei. That's how we used to work together. Now, uh, I founded uh, Ledger Capital uh, a year ago, and Ledger Capital uh, mainly sponsors uh, after parties of Beyond Blocks. That's our main business. <laughs> um, our side business is uh, we're a, a digital asset investment firm and uh, an investment bank. We work, we, uh, we work with mostly very large corporates, governments, uh, as well as big uh, digital asset companies like Binance um, uh, in the space. OK, so I better tell you who I am. I'm uh, C uh, James McCready. I'm the CEO of OddUp. Uh, we rate startups, investors, and now we do crypto ICOs and cryptocurrencies as well. So it's been a very interesting time for the industry uh, in a whole. So I I've been brought into this conversation to sort of talk about innovation in China. And so when we talk about innovation in China, I have some slides to look at. Can we get the slides? Let's talk about this lovely website. Who knows this website? Hands up. Yep, you should. OK. Innovation in China. Now, can you see a general theme here? What do they all look like? <laughs> So what we're talking about innovation in China, there's a misperception in China. Wait, I'm going to earmark you here. Uh, there's a misperception in China there's a lot of non-innovation happening. And the blockchain is actually just an excuse for a bull market and so forth, and a, a bear market as we are currently now. So let's talk about innovation in China, particularly where Binance is at the moment, and what you guys are doing in the blockchain. And ultimately, and for everyone else, you know. Is there actually real use cases of blockchain rather than cryptocurrency exchanges, which we just saw? Um, yeah, I mean, I think for, for Binance, uh, we started off our uh, Binance Labs, which is our uh, investment business, about six months ago. And we've invested in uh, quite a number of projects uh, that came out of China, uh, most notably uh, Cocos and, uh, and Fenex. So I think um, what we're seeing there is, is actually um, some of the more, I would say, traditional uh, consumer internet businesses that are uh, shifting their businesses or shifting their user base onto the blockchain. And then, or, and also, um, I would say, um, building up sort of like two things that are really, really important that I see. Is, um, in addition, one is basically building, leveraging on their existing community uh, and basically um, coming out with uh, a token program that can help them to grow the business from that. And then second of all, I think, is um, how to expand that user base they have and that community they have um, beyond China. I think that's something that is very unique uh, that I'm seeing in China right now. And for the two of you, what sort of, how are you seeing blockchain work in China as opposed to what's been the last year of trading headlines? What's it actually happening in China? Because there's a misperception, particularly in the West, where everyone's talking about 
trading, 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 currencies going up, currencies going down, but let's separate cryptocurrencies versus the blockchain. Deng, I'll start with you. Sure. Um, I, think, I think there may be a perception out there that uh, China's innovation or, or the business activities are, are primarily focused on the trading of digital assets, and, um, which is a pretty centralized business because the largest uh, exchanges in the world uh, happen to be from China, Binance, Huobi, OKX. But I think you know, the, the innovation of blockchain in China is, very, is multifaceted, just like any other country. Uh, any other sort of major uh, countries or, or tech hubs. Uh, you know, if you look at public infrastructure, or you look at the top 20 uh, tokens by token value, probably five or six, maybe seven, are based out of China. Um, Tron is based out of China. Uh, VeChain, Ontology, Neo, um, they are based out of China. So they're, I think they're. Uh, equally as active in the, in the innovation in, in the public infrastructure. And on the uh, uh, application side, I think you know, China especially is a, um, uh, Chinese developers are, are, are known to be uh, very fast followers, you know, in, even back in the traditional internet days. And I think they've continued to uh, Use that to their advantage in the in the in the D app uh, application uh, space. Uh, lastly, uh, on the government side, there's a Chinese government, both central and municipal government, actually are some of the most uh, advanced uh, out of all the countries in the world in research and development into the blockchain technology, uh, as well as. Uh, setting aside funds to uh, support private enterprises uh, into both research and application of blockchain te technology. That being said, you know, I think it's, it's, it's somewhat of an oxymoron you know, when a government, especially a, a very centralized government, gets involved in blockchain activities where the native ethos is, is decentralization. But, um, um, I think very soon people around the world will see uh, actual applications of blockchain that's not really in a decentralized fashion, but you know, it's utilized by the government. But it's, you know, it's an e-government uh, innovation in and itself of blockchain. Which sort of leads me to Jasper. Now, everyone knows eToro. Uh, Ito is probably one of the biggest uh, trading platforms in the world. You do everything from securities and now getting into crypto. You're in Shanghai now. You've sort of seen it grow. From let's take the trading element out, which is very much what you guys do, to what the innovations, do, what the innovations out there, particularly in Shanghai, Beijing, Shenzhen, and so forth. What are you seeing on the ground? Uh, you mean like taking off the trading? Like let's, let's, take, let's not talk about trading because everyone's already sad. They're all waiting for moon out there. <laughs> Don't worry, the moon's going to happen soon enough. But right. let's talk about projects. Right. So what are projects or uh, businesses that are being built in China? Okay. How are they being scaling? What have you been seeing? Right. So, so I actually came back from a forum in Sichang, also talking about blockchain uh, technology and innovation. Right. So actually, like, uh, like the last uh, questions that we asked, like in terms of trading and blockchain, you know, why people keep talking about trading, not blockchain? Mm -hmm. That's because like, blockchain like, in China is actually developing, but people are more low profile on that. But actually, there are a lot of like, interesting innovation going on. Even like, the government and the university is actually working on that. So uh, like, for example, the supply chain uh, related blockchain, it's actually a very big topic in uh, China right now. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, you know, like the, the, uh, the blockchain that they will apply on the uh, farmer, for example, is actually a very big business, uh, uh, especially in Sichuan, because uh, it's actually the western part of China. Uh, the population is actually very high over there. Um, they are all like uh, pretty much trying to use blockchain to help improve uh, what's going on over there. Uh, it's only because like trading it's always more fascinating and more exciting. That's why people are keep talking about trading. And also like, a lot of top exchange in China, uh, you know, they pretty much like, get clients from the retail side, and the retail side is actually more excited with the price volatility. So I would say it's actually a lot of innovation on blockchain going on in China. 
Uh, it's just people not getting a lot more in, uh, in attention on that. Okay, which leads me to the curious case of Binance. Um, so when we look at, and, and I've been to both locations many times this year, and we see the US, the very much the, the rhetoric is product, 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 product. Don't worry about valuations, don't worry about tokens, worry about the product. But here we have Binance, which is the leading exchange in the world, and you've actually got a great brand around that. So in the past, there was always, and you know, going back a few or four years, there was always Apple and then there was Xiaomi, but Xiaomi's over the years has sort of built their own brand, building their own products. Now, way to you, you mentioned before, uh, outside this uh, um, chat, about how Binance is building a global brand, which ultimately will help sort of and you know, sort of venture in and build up the next entrepreneurs in China. So tell us a bit about what Binance is doing for your brand and ultimately how it can help China uh, sort of build their blockchain entrepreneurs, build their projects. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you can't talk about Binance without talking about our, our, our co-founders, uh, CZ and He Yi. Um, they're both uh, longtime entrepreneurs um, physically based in China, as, I was, as uh, I was myself. I've been living in Beijing for the last, um, since 2005. And then that's where I met them, right? So I think um, Binance is a very unique brand in that, first of all, you know, props to CZ of, of basically trademarking the name. I think that's, that's a good start. It um, doesn't really have a Chinese sounding name. So it was able to basically walk, so walk outside of China and then has a name that is pretty recognizable and uh, pretty easily pronounceable, I think, um, other than people calling it Beyonce, which uh, still exists. Um, but I think other than that, I think um, one of the things that um, we've been relentlessly focusing on is basically um, uh, through, I guess, a combination of our customer service and through sort of, you know, being extremely vigilant on the marketing and PR side of it is basically to protect that brand on a global basis and then um, doing that. Um, and then that goes back to basically sort of like if you look at Hoi's background, you know, she came out of a very strong uh, marketing background. She was previously the co-founder and, and CMO at, uh, at OKCoin before. So, so sort of like, um, so, and then, so I think from that, what you found is that Binance is actually a very uniquely Chinese company at its, at its core, but it's also a uniquely uh, Western company because of the background that a lot of the, uh, sort of the co-founders, uh, including CZ and then you know, and myself, is more of a Western background. So I think that combination has allowed us to basically um, walk out of China more comfortably versus some of the other uh, exchanges, I would say. Okay, which leads me to be devil's advocate here. Walk out of China is what you just said, if mm -hmm. I'm correct. So, um, a controversial question. Three of the biggest exchanges in the world, including yourselves, have left China. Now, I see myself from Hong Kong, everyone should be supporting us as a Hong Kong company, but uh, you know, I would say that majority of your users would be global. So, shouldn't China be supporting their entrepreneurs? And, and you know, sort of, and I'm, this is a question for everyone, and it's not just signaled on Binance and Wei particularly, but, you know, shouldn't there be more love to the startup community? Because everywhere in the world, everyone else wants to be the Silicon Valley of everywhere else. So tell me, and I mean, I'll pass that question to you, Deng, maybe first. You know, what, what can the government do to back their superstars? I think, I think the fact that the top uh, exchanges as well as some of the top uh, public infrastructures in blockchain has emerged in China, has that already spoke to, has spoken to uh, how conducive an environment for innovation, for adoption of new technology, as well as a wealth of engineering talent that China has. And that's, you know, sort of also handling applications with very, very high frequency um, volume and, and engagement. That's something that uh, entrepreneurs in China have a unique uh, experience with, you know, compared to, you know, maybe a smaller country. So, so that's that. I mean, that's the reason they, these, 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 these uh, big companies came out of China. Mm. But, uh, but when it comes to fintech and, uh, and, and, and a country uh, with China's state centralization, the, the regulation around fintech, and when it comes to especially relevant to trading platforms, less so relevant to a blockchain infrastructure product, uh, project. You didn't hear, you know, Justin Sung getting kicked out of China yet. Mm -hmm. um, yet, is that, is, that, <laughs> is that a prediction? <laughs> yeah. um, so, I mean, when it comes to trading, especially retail trading, 
it's uh, it's in, in in conflict with very specific regulations that yeah. are unfortunately already in place uh, in even in China. So uh, there needs to be, um, I think, uh, reconciliation down the road, and that's always happened in any sort of fintech innovations. I think right now uh, the enforcement uh, uh, is done somewhat by the book today, and which is why you know. Um, you're hearing how you know some of the teams are no longer in China, but you know what, Huobi and OKS are still in China. They're actually not allowed to leave China, but they're they're happily living and working in China. Which I'm going to leave the question to Wei. That's hardly keeping the, the entrepreneur in China, right? Well, that's not <laughs> China. Let's not talk about that. <laughs> um, I'm going to put this to Wei because he's sort of living that, and then sort of have yourself, Jasper, as a, a third party, Wei. You talk about going abroad and building a brilliant brand out of it, and everyone loves the brand that you guys are doing it, but what could make your lives easier? Or is that too hard of a question to answer? What's the question? The question is, what could China do to welcome companies uh, in, is it regulatory uh, changes? Is it the ability to um, you know, sort of be more adoptive to what people like Binance, OKS, Wabi are doing? So what could make lives easier for Let's talk of the exchanges on the, in, the, in, the, in the country. Yeah, I mean, I think having lived in China for, for such a long time and having been um, working in the tech space in China for such a long time and having coming from like a finance background, I think um, um, when you're doing something new in China, uh, when you're doing something that hasn't been done before in China, um, you kind of always operate in a gray space. Mm -hmm. it, it, there, there's not a black or, or, or white, you know, there's not going to be a legal opinion that's going to say, bam, you're legal, right? I mean, I don't think... And if somebody gives you that, then just fire that lawyer. Don't even work with that person in the first place, right? Because if you look at sort of like, um, you know, traditional internet company um, that are legally owned by local Chinese but are listed on NASDAQ uh, that's held through a Cayman company through a VIE structure, I mean, that's a gray area that was started off by Sina back in the late 90s and the early 2000s, right? And that became a commonly used model for VCs to invest US dollars into Chinese companies. Was that legal? Is not allowed? I mean, it's basically, I think in China it's more about, um, if you look at sort of the regimes, it's, it's actually fairly practical um, in terms of encouraging new things to happen, um, encouraging uh, innovation to happen. And, um, you know, it has, I mean, as Ding mentioned, it has the intellectual capital and the financial capital to back all of it. So I think it's silly for, 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 the, uh, for the government or, or for, for them to not to follow that sort of, that type of innovation going forward. Um, it just so happens that the business that we're in is in a, in a bigger area, not just in China, but I think around the world. So, um, but what we're seeing is that over the last six months, 12 months, um, you know, just with general crypto adoption, as well as general understanding of what this new asset class is, um, you are seeing more, you know, progressive regulations in different places. And, uh, and wherever that happens, basically you're seeing financial capital, intellectual capital floating in. Um, so you start to see jurisdictions competing for that financial and intellectual talent. And it's no different, I think, in anywhere in the world. So Jasper, as a third party to this, um, what are you seeing? What can be done? Uh, and it comes back to adoption and also, I mean, there's going to be regulation questions. There's going to be a lot of things in that sort of gray area that Wei just pointed out to, which I think most governments will still try and figure out. But from your perspective, which is a very heavy trading platform, but watching things to uh, connect with, I mean, you're about to mention making life easier. So how does it make life easier for you guys and for every other entrepreneur? So. Uh, like instead of like walking out of China, we're actually walking into China, right? So uh, we've been building up the brand in Western country for 10 years, and three years ago, we just stepped into China. Uh, so in China, just like what uh, Wei was saying, uh, there are a lot of gray areas. Like in China, they basically define what you cannot do, and apart, like, beside that, you can always try and try and error, right? So uh, for, for us, like, what we're trying to do in China like, to, is to try to find like, potentially a strategic partner in China, like getting investment, for example, us like, getting investment from Ping An, getting investment from CMF, that we can actually have a local partner to support us, right? And you pretty much need to respect some of the uh, 
regulation in China. Like, for example, trading, uh, Ding was mentioning, is, uh, is a very sensitive topic in China. Uh, when China decided not to allow people to do all the book trading in crypto, what we are doing is try to you know, stop authoring crypto trading within China, within mainland China. So you have to play with the rules at the very beginning, start to talk to the regulators. Like for example, right now in Hong Kong, there's a sandbox going on, right? Mm -hmm. So we try to get in and talk to them. In China, we start to talk to, for example, like in Sichuan, there's just a FinTech association uh, they just funded, and they, they're trying to do a sandbox as well, potentially. That's how we try to step in, know more about you know, the area, and you know, that will help you to make your life easier, how to really uh, build a business in China. Okay, so this is a question for you. I'll start with you, Deng. Since the new uh, power has moved into Washington, there has been a sentiment across Silicon Valley of innovation may be stifled. I'm very careful with what I say here. Um, uh, and there was comments by many in the media, including myself, that China would accelerate and beat Silicon Valley at their own game. On one hand, we're hearing there needs to be regulation, there needs to be things to make life easier, but on the other hand, China has the ability to completely accelerate past the US. So now looking at where you've got hands in both parts of the world, um, and of course there's a trade war which is, could and could, it has affected some startups, I do know that. What are you seeing and how can China get the edge over Silicon Valley, particularly in the blockchain space? And this is a question for all of you guys. Mm. I think uh, trade war aside, I think, I think one, one area where I think, I think China has a lot of potential is in the, uh, the regulatory aspect of this blockchain innovation. I think adoption of blockchain, as you know, we've been talking about it, I think a lot of that, it's not just a technology innovation, but it's also a regulatory innovation. I think naturally, I think uh, uh, China has two advantages. One is that uh, it doesn't, not all regulations are clear specific yet. You know, um, for example, the financial market, it's been around for 30 years as opposed to over 100 years in the States. So clearly some, there are still rules and regulations that are not present yet. Uh, which means the, the, the speed of uh, adoption of maybe a new paradigm is, uh, will face less resistance. You know, I think that's, this we have seen in the United States and I think a lot of, a lot of blockchain regulation has hit roadblocks because there are um, uh, regulations built around incumbent interests that, are, that have been around for more than 100 years. I think in China, it doesn't have that baggage. So I think that's always been one advantage that China has over uh, other countries. But of course, you know, there are smaller countries, less developed countries that will have this logic of advantage as well. Uh, but those may not be as big of a market. So in balance, I think China is pretty good ground for that kind of innovation. Uh, I think the other, the other uh, area is that uh, I think, you know, as opposed to the valley, innovation in China is, uh, has a, has a very, uh, has an has a orchestration undertone to it. So it's, you know, the speed at which people innovate, the direction at which people innovate, uh, the format of innovation, a lot of that is a product of central planning. Um, obviously, you know, China is not as capitalist a country now, but policies are sort of uh, uh, promulgated that created a ground of in which direction should innovation uh, B, you know, is it, you know, you know, innovation, innovation is in mobile payment adoption, for example, you know, that's sort of a, an area that's created by policy that allows such mass adoption of it. Um, so uh, I think that's, that's an area that Chinese government's done very well so far, you know, you need to keep a balance, you need a balance between orchestration uh, and over orchestration to, to the, to the, to the, to the effect of micromanaging. Um, so I think because blockchain adoption so much is about, it's about technology, but so much is about, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 re regulation innovation, uh, innovation of organization, innovation of corporate entities, business models. So I think, I think 
uh, with careful orchestration uh, by the Chinese government, I think they also they would be uh, they would be in an advantageous spot. Good. So, Jasper, following what Deng's comments are, you're seeing those, and, and this is a question, still the same question of uh, China beating SV. And I think Deng mentioned before, you've got VeChain, you've got Tron, you've got all these other projects that are out there. You've got great companies like Binance and OKX and Huobi and all the others, they're sort of leading the charge. Now, from a third party taking a step back, um, you know, what are you seeing as, you know, how can China beat Silicon Valley? So, <clears throat> I also will break into like two phases, right? So, uh, a lot of uh, innovation center like Silicon Valley or even like uh, Israel, like they are very startup uh, spirit. They are trying to make things like from zero to one. Actually, in China, it's all about mass adoption. Like they can always make one into hundreds, right? So in the in the past like years, you know, there are a lot of innovation when they go to China, they try to evolve themselves and make it like even better to be adopted by the mass uh, audience. Now, if you look at uh, Uber, you know, now you have Didi, you know, you, if you look at a lot of other, like for example, WeChat, uh, it comes from potentially the ideas of, of instant messaging apps, but now they also add into like payment, you know, like you can also pay utility bill. So they actually try to make one into 100. Uh, and the second phase is what you are asking right now, like uh, how we can also become uh, like making things also from zero to one within China and then one to hundreds, right? And I can actually see that happening, not necessarily like uh, uh, not happening, right? So I think definitely blockchain, it will be a very good start for China to be leading because when we talk about blockchain, when we talk about crypto, it's all about mass adoption. And China has the spirit in the past. Like for example, uh, when we talk about digital payment, we have Alipay right now, like day to day when I, when I was in mainland China, I don't need to bring cash anymore, right? So this kind of adoption, uh, Chinese people, they are already very familiar with. And, and when we start having a good adoption in terms of blockchain, I think China also have good enough population to try to adapt it and try to improve it because we have enough population over there. So I think this is a very good chance for us to be, become leading. In so, terms of, um, Wei, I'm going to ask this question because Jasper brought up a point. Who's seen the movie Black Panther? Hands up. Who's seen the movie Black Panther? Okay, so have I. Now, did you notice in Black Panther, vibranium or whatever that material was, solved every crisis. When I talk to entrepreneurs around here, blockchain's going to solve the problem. Hey, you know what? I'm dying. I've lost my arm. I've lost my leg. Let's put some blockchain on and I'll survive. So I think this has been a real bad... Um, what shall I say, as sort of a catchphrase that people are using, let's use real adoption. I and mean, I'm looking at Binance, you've got you've the most amount of traders on the planet, most amount of users on the planet in your space. You are already beating Silicon Valley. Blockchain is just one of the products that, you're, that ultimately you're selling and making money from and growing from it. So if we look at, let's not take blockchain as the fix of everything, let's just think of it as a business 101, how is Binance going to continue to beat Silicon Valley? Because you're bigger than, I guess, Coinbase, which would be the biggest in the US. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll answer, I think, I'll probably answer two questions. One is how Binance is going to beat Silicon Valley. And the other question is how is China going to fight it out with Silicon Valley? I actually don't think that war is going to take place in China. I don't think that war is going to take place in Silicon Valley. That war is going to take place in, all over the world. Like, for example, like, um, we just launched our fiat exchange in Uganda with plans to basically build up a giant fiat to crypto business to cover the continent of Africa, about 2 billion people, right? Um, I don't think Silicon Valley is there, right? I think it's basically, um, we're, we're, we're about to launch a fiat exchange in Singapore, right? I, I don't think sort of like Silicon Valley is there. I think, it's, I think like what you're seeing about China is actually, you're actually seeing, it's, it, let's take the country out of it and just focus on the people, which are basically Chinese entrepreneurs, right? I think Chinese entrepreneurs, um, what we have seen over the last two years is um, have had both uh, understanding of global culture, of global language, 
and have had the freedom of movement that wasn't, didn't exist to the prior generation of entrepreneurs that came out of China. And I think that's where the real war is going to take place. It's not going to take place you know, in Beijing or in Silicon Valley. I actually think it's going to be the group of people who are, who are global nomads who are basically willing to live it and work it into different and bring that innovation, that, that whatever it is, to other parts of the world. Because um, you know, that's what I think, you know, or what Binance sort of think the, the, the sort of the blockchain ecosystem or the Binance ecosystem that we're build, trying to build is. It's a global ecosystem. This is a really good answer. So the short answer is, is it's World War Blockchain. I guess we're going to use the call. Can we, call, can we coin that term? Last question before we open up. Four questions from the audience is, now, last year, China investors field a huge boom. Call it a casino, whatever you want to call it. Um, many people lost money. A lot of people are complaining. And so, uh, similar to the startup boom we've seen over the years, when people are making money, everyone's supportive. They think it's the next sliced bread, less milk, what have you. So, now all of the three of you are in this space. So, I guess this is more interesting. Now, what, what will this space look like in the next six to 12 months when there's less conversations about price? And, and mooning, and more about the technology and the product around it. So, Deng, I'll start with you. So, let's look at the next, and put China in there as well. What do you see in for the, the market, at least in the next 12 months? Mm -hmm. I think uh, a few things. One is, I think, on the capital side, uh, there, will be, there will be a decreasing uh, participation from retail investors, um, but there will be increasing um, participation from uh, um, institutional investors. Um, for example, ourselves, you know, we haven't seen, we, we, we didn't go crazy last year, but we have continued to paste into the spare market, uh, invest in terms of investment. But the type of investment we make uh, has shifted somewhat. I think, I think it's maybe, in, in my view, be representative of uh, of one angle of how this market will evolve in the next three to six months, is that uh, I think more, there will be more um, projects uh, with uh, a very solid logic for adoption, uh, closer to adoption, uh, that will emerge. There will be projects that um, have very uh, solid, uh, uh, you know, whether it's technical or financial, uh, resources backing it that maintains a healthy token economics even through the bear market. So I think uh, it, it is one of our investment focus and I think it's, it will be, the market will also see more and more of these projects, projects done by big internet companies. Um, we work with Opera, working with Kakao Talk, uh, these, type of, these type of projects that have the user base already. They have uh, the engineering resource and they have the, the financial wherewithal to make sure that the token economics, uh, token economy uh, is healthy enough for them to sustain through a bear market. Um, 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 it's I, a very I, politically correct answer. I like it a lot. No price targets, nothing like that. You've gone the safe option. That's very smart of you. Really? Okay. <laughs> um, but that's uh, it's, it's actually how I think because I, I, I don't, uh, personally, I, I come from a traditional, mm. uh, you know, finance and tech background, and, and, and I would like to see this market um, um, evolving into something that's more, uh, that's more, that's more sensible, you mm. know, in terms of every participant is more sensible. The issuer, the investor, the retail, uh, regulators, all kind of going towards a more sensible direction. And I think in this next three to six months, we'll be have, you know, we'll probably, we'll, we'll probably, we'll be at a historical low in terms of faith, you know, in, in, in blockchain, you know, for historical, I guess, you know, not historical, low. it's been lower before, but in the last, say, 18 to 12, 24 months, it will be a historical low. So what kind of uh, activities will, 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 will inject faith into, uh, in, into this market? And what can I do to inject faith into this market is I think is these type of uh, well-organized, well-resourced, large projects, um, sometimes even government backed to kind of to increase the mix of these, these type of 
uh, participation in the... To get them uh, there. So, Jasper and Wei, do you agree with that sentiment before we open up for questions? We're running out of time. Sort of, that's, the market's more going to be about institution rather than, rather than the retail? Is that a yes? Maybe not for you. You would get very upset. Yeah, because, no, like, uh, I mean, first of all, this is not just happening in China. It's actually a global thing, right? <clears throat> in terms of trading, like for us, trading crypto is actually just one uh, SS investment that you can do. Mm -hmm. For example, in our platform, people can still trade like stock, FX ETF in our platform, right? So I think for, for the retail side, people are very realistic. When the market is, is bull market, they will just come, you don't even need to do advertisement, right? Mm -hmm. Like Itaro, we've been doing a lot of advertisement to try to attract those retail clients. But in last years, we've been seeing like very proactive engagement coming from the retail side. But when the market is not good, the retail side will also like disappear very fast, right? So, so I, I, I probably would agree, like institutional, they will probably like stay longer, even though this is a bearish market, people start to like the good, that the good people, the solid team start to building up, uh, you know, the technology. And we have to wait for this kind of good team to build mass adoption, then the retail will come back again. I may have to stop you there. I think we've got 20 seconds. Ask way a question. Who wants to ask a question? Any questions across? No question. Then my last question to you, Wei, is. There's one oh, sorry. Way. Question. Yell, please. Hi, I was wondering what your, um, you guys think the stance is on big giants such as um, Alibaba, Tencent, and Baidu Wei, regarding North. blockchain technologies and cryptocurrencies. Why are we starting with you on this one? Mm -hmm. uh, they are all investing in it, and they're all putting money and people and resources behind it. You just don't know about it just yet. <laughs> that would be my, like, like, seriously. Very, very good answer. Yeah. Very good answer. Yeah, well, I, maybe I can provide more, a little more, <laughs> more, color. A little more insight. You know, we, we have, uh, we have uh, regular conversations with these large corporates. Um, uh, we haven't done the deals with them, but that's because of regulatory reasons. So they are all heavily invested, like Wei said. Uh, just to give you some data point, Alibaba has 250 engineers uh, in the blockchain department, it's under, and financial. Uh, Tencent has you know, 300, 400, very big numbers. Um, but those so far, I would say, uh, Baidu has done their private blockchain, by the way. Um, so the, but those, those uh, from, from Chinese, big Chinese companies, I think they're looking at a couple of things. They're looking at how blockchain can be uh, applied in their existing uh, business and workflow. And that's not always a very uh, easy proposition. You know, for Alibaba, it's, uh, you know, they were about to acquire MoneyGram and, you know, cross-border cross -border, uh, transaction, cross-border transfer, that's one application area. Um, but uh, but they're, none of them are thinking about tokenization, mm -hmm. and none of them are thinking about building a true public uh, infrastructure. I think we'll see internet giants in other countries start thinking about building decentralized infrastructure before Chinese giants do, because Chinese giants, they don't have to. They're dominating a big enough market. They're not under any existential threat by blockchain today. So, ask this question here. I think we have yes. one more. Uh, my name is uh, Khalid Dianov. I'm from Big X Digital Exchange. My question is, uh, with uh, hundreds of uh, digital exchanges uh, in the space these days, uh, when do you think uh, we'll see consolidation in the sector? Uh, exchanges buying each other, mergers and acquisitions. Any thought on that? I think you can answer this question. Uh, the question was, when are we going to see consolidation in the market, particularly in the exchange space? Uh, is it happening now? Are you going to tell us you're going to about to buy someone? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I, I think um, exchange as a business model, I think, is um, as long as it remains uh, viable, I think there's no reason for you to exit the business. But I think, um, um, I think with sort of like, you know, market always corrects one way or another, like overcorrects the limit one way or another. So I think um, the next six months is going to be very interesting for the exchange world. 
I definitely would say yes. I, there will be a lot of merge and acquisition. So is eToro about to buy someone? I cannot comment on that. <laughs> uh, but I would say like probably 80% of the exchange is going to be very difficult for the upcoming six months. Mm. And we open for like potential uh, acquisition for sure, like uh, in terms of good team, talents, market share. Um, and actually, we are building up our own exchange and going to be launched next year. Um, so yeah, I, I, I do think that will be the, uh, the things. Exchange, you guys should talk. Maybe you have some synergies. <laughs> and on that note, um, I... Yeah, it's commercial <laughs> synergies, who knows? Maybe you can support more CNBC shows. We never know. So um, <laughs> guys, on that note, uh, enough humor, enough insights. Thanks. Please thank every, my, my wonderful esteemed panelists here. And uh, thank you for joining this conversation.